We need to show the government what is required and not these rather misinforming figures of 300,000. As I understood it in the way David put it, this was for this area, but in fact it's a national figure. So I think that is again is a little bit misleading. Therefore, in another paragraph, and this is only part of a, a long letter that no one from the council has had the courtesy to reply to from September. Therefore from, therefore, from the revised figures, and by utilising empty properties in the borough, along with brownfield development at Wirral Waters, and other sites such as the old Premier Brown's site at Morton, the council now acknowledge that they can safely deal with the required housing of the Wirral without encroaching on Greenbelt. Again, no reply to this one whatsoever. And this is probably the third or fourth letter I've written over several months. So there's a lack of response from the council and no real good thinking from the council about what the people of Wirral need and why there is not more regeneration of brownfield sites and more starter homes. Thank you very much. over here that indicates that there's a gentleman in the striped shirt. What I'm intending to do, because I know a number of colleagues have indicated they like to say something, and you know, I'm happy to say that we've all been in listening mode, so that should help in terms of the responses. So I'll get the gentleman there, a uh, gentleman in the striped shirt, and finish off with the gentleman in the check shirt. Unless there is any, is there anyone who's desperate to say something that has to have their point raised? Before we finish. Okay. Oh. And, and the lady in the uh, in front of the gentleman who now has the microphone. So uh, as we'll include you too, and then we'll let colleagues have a say as well. So, sir. I've been to a number of the um, consultations, and at each consultation that I've been to, I've brought up the point that Birkenhead is one of the most deprived areas in the country. <coughs> the state of housing down there and where people have to live, and I'm not. Just talking about Birkenhead, I'm talking Rock Ferry, New Ferry, Ellesmere Port, Wallasey. Right? These people have been left. If you go around the Fraybrick estate, right, at the, in the north end of Birkenhead, <laughs> that place looks like Beirut, and you've got people living there. You've done nothing to help these people, nothing at all. And that's, these are all people who support Labour. You, as a Labour council, have let them down. There's no regeneration. In, in these areas, and these people are left. And what you're trying to do is to sell our green belt to make some money. You're trying to sell it for 30 feet of silver. The people of the world will not have it. I'll make that clear now, because we will fight you all the way. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm Caroline Evans, I represent the Colby Society and I know there are other societies here and what I wanted to say was listening to everything that people have said I think the council should be taking a much broader view like the lady in the back said it is absolutely appalling the state of some of the parts of the Wirral I've worked in Manchester all my life I've seen Salford Keys developed by I believe Peel Waters it's a fantastic development and it's really really helped the people of Manchester we do not need green belt building here. What we need is developing those areas and what we're all waters I presume are proposing. And I would like you here to say to the people here that you will promise not to build on our green belt where there is farmland. At the moment, this country only supports 60% of its food supply by its own farming. When we have Brexit, we're only going to be able to grow 40% of our food. Where is the sense in threatening farmers threatening to take their livelihoods away, threatening decent food for the local population just to make a small profit on some houses when you have so much other land. I would really like it if you would promise that, but I don't think you will. <laughs> I didn't think this could get more controversial, but we managed to throw Brexit into it. Yeah. Um, I, just, just to be clear, and I'm, I'm sure you would get a um, they happen to be Conservative councillors and Lib Dems and, and Greens and so on. I'm sure you'd get a personal commitment from every one of them that we wouldn't be building on Greenbelt. That is a stated policy. 
uh, so I can give you that commitment. It is much more, um, it is a matter, as David has said, that he will do his report, it will go to the Cabinet and the Cabinet will make the decision. Although Phil Davis did say that, you know, over his dead body there would be any building on the green belt. So that's got to be worth something. So the man, the man in the blue one, I'll show you. Okay, uh, David Billington, an Irby resident. Um, I have a very simple point, which won't exercise any statistics whatsoever. But I need to preface this, first of all, with an apology to David. I wouldn't have your job for all the team China made. I really wouldn't. But I lost count of the number of probabilities you used in your presentation and in your answers. The fundamental thing at the moment is we don't know where the goalposts are. How many do we need to build? We don't know. Okay. And I actually went to a presentation by Peel, of all people, on Friday, just to listen to the other side of the fence. Right? And I actually think maybe the council and Peel are actually beginning to talk to each other. They might even work together, God forbid. Right? When we can decide where the goalposts are, when we know how many we need to build, when we know how many peel will or won't produce, only then can you go out to consultation. For at the moment, it is totally flawed. For goodness sake, find out what the targets are and then make your actions, then consult. So, the last speaker on this, and then I'm going to transfer it over. So I should take the panel if there's a question to ask. But we'll, we'll I'll throw it open to uh, colleagues to, to make their contributions. So, thank you, Chairman. Um, John Heath, uh, representing uh, IPAS. Um, sorry, IPAS. IPAS, the room. Irby, sorry, I thought most of them are members, aren't they? Uh, they will be after tonight. Irby, um, uh, Thurston, Pensby Amenity Society. And it also covers parts of Barston and uh, all the areas just slightly around our area. Uh, we've got um, 600 um, people we represent, so it isn't me speaking as an individual. Um, maybe I should be speaking better. Um, just in passing, I asked David a question um, at, two, at a meeting before it now, and I've written in uh, about that, qu uh, that question, and it hasn't been answered. It needs to be answered, David, and um, uh, as I started last time when I spoke, you were a champion of Greenbelt, and I don't know what's happened to you. Um, I can only see things coming from outside. What we're told is that it's the only nasty government's fault, and these are government statistics. Well, if you actually look at it, there were 13 scenarios that um, the consultants that they employ came up with. Now, of those 13, one was vastly too high and was thrown out by every, all sides agreed that. In this report, these consultants have put a caveat in. They are basically saying in there, these growth figures are not ours. These growth figures have been given to us by the council. So they have basically stood back and said, we'll do the work, but we'll base it on your projections. And it's absolutely quite clear in that report. Now, that 803 houses was towards the top end of all the scenarios. That means our council decided that they wanted to, to take the biggest, step, well not the biggest, but one of the highest development um, potential and potential growth. They, we've had a look at it, we've had professionals, we've now got about 20 groups that are um, community groups, environmental groups, um, like ourselves, that's in the Wirral Green Space Alliance, and we have backing, we've got financial backing, and we are going to take this all the way to the court. If it needs to go that far, senses and see. We had it looked at professionally, and already the conclusions are it's very, very unlikely that we need to go into Greenbelt. It passed two years ago, was worried about this. Uh, could see it coming, and we did a study of every Greenbelt site in our area, every single one of them. We produced a report, we 
uh, we graded every single uh, site and we gave a priority list and gave it confidentially to the council for their information. We're saying that this is like this is uh, backed by 600 residents, if you like. That's almost exclusively been totally ignored. Um, and that one, you were left to wonder at what point uh, the council is going to take the feelings of the people it represents as instruction because they are not following what the majority of people I detect want. Well, thank you. John, uh, thank you for that. And I'll give it to Claire now because I, I know John very well for the work uh, that he does for a range of organisations, including in that. So, uh, David, I'm going to let you respond to the, uh, the, there are a whole series of concerns, particularly no one seems to be responding to letters that are being sent in to make these points and why that should be the case. And then I'm going to have a quick go around the table. Okay, so David. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Green. I'll just try and pick up a couple of those because obviously there's a lot of points in what was said there. But can I just clarify um, just a couple of things that were said that, that are not quite accurate? The first of all is that we're not subject to government intervention on our local plan at this present time. Okay? Government gave an indication they were looking at that, um, but we are not under formal intervention. So we have our timetable and we're producing our plan. Um, in terms of responding to the correspondence that we're getting in, we're getting literally hundreds of uh, representations, letters, emails coming in to us. Now, we're trying to respond to all of those as quickly as we can, but clearly that will take us time to get through that. Specifically in return, in relation to John's uh, email that comes in, there's been several <coughs> emails with drafted responses um, to a couple of those. We've got a couple more to complete, so you will get those responses from us. And I think there's a lot of questions uh, written into this constituency committee tonight. I think we've answered most of those already um, in writing as well. So we will continue to try and do that. Um, the other thing, just to pick up a couple of points, the 803 number, um, that, were, that was uh, a number for objectively assessed need. That does not include any economic growth. The projections that John's referring to, if you look at the reports, the numbers with economic growth are in excess of that, and they could go up to 1,200 dwellings a year on the on the highest level of growth. So those could go down. Those, yeah. Okay. In terms of growth, they, they don't. And all, we've all been well in the main. We've all been. Yeah. Uh, in the main, we've all been very good. So let's let David. No, I, I just we might to... disagree with him. We might be right to disagree, but he has the right to be heard in. in Respectfully, yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify that that point about the 803 number. A um, couple of other things just to say uh, that um, I think one of the ladies at the back raised the issue about, um, if you like, looking at all areas in Will. Well, that's what Will's local plan actually does. Um, if you look at the regeneration work that we have done, for example, in the north end of Birkenhead, uh, we keep more through the housing market renewal initiative. Uh, vast areas of the north end of Birkenhead have been transformed by that, S, that uh, regeneration and that investment. If you look at parts of uh, Rock Ferry, where again we've been looking at the housing market renewal initiative, uh, lots of new properties have gone up there, that area is being regenerated. We're actively working on new ferry and places like that at the present time. Shortly we hope to have a growth company in place which will enable us to focus on the centre of Birkenhead, the town centre, Woodside, and the Hamilton Square area. So we're doing all of this other activity alongside all the brownfield developments. In terms of empty properties, uh, there are just about 4,600 uh, properties in Wirral at the present time. We're bringing back into economic use somewhere in the region about 260 of those properties each year. Um, over the last five years, we've brought back just over 1,447 into economic use. So where we can bring those empty properties back in, we're doing that. Uh, where we can increase the densities, where it's appropriate to do so on brownfield sites, we're doing that. 
examples of things that we've done so far, if you know the Sainsbury's in Upton, uh, behind there there's a piece of derelict land for the last 30 years, it was contaminated, nothing happening with it. Spoke to a housing developer, you go there today, you've got a housing development on a site that at one time there was no demand for. So we're doing all of this work in addition to looking at the local plan and we're looking at everything in its context. In I'll probably leave it there, uh, Councillor Green, if I may, because obviously there's lots of other comments, but obviously I'm conscious... Well, well we're, we're, we are capturing those, well. aren't we? So everyone's comments has been, have been captured and we'll make sure they're fed and included in, in the process, David, is that yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll respond to any questions that are asked, but it will take us a little bit of time because obviously there's so many questions coming in at the moment. Okay. All right. Um, now, I did say that we were. We, we'll get another. A, we will have a bit of question time. Go on then. Yes. caveated 
by a number of things. Now, I'm sorry about that, but this... this well, welcome to our can I, can I, can I ask you, can, can I, could I urge caution on that, David? Because I, I, I understand um, you know, how these things work. But once you've said it, yes. it will be a number that will be out there yes. and everyone will start quoting. And if, if it changes, and it will be challenged, no doubt, um, you know, people will end up accusing you of all sorts, um, ranging from, you know, well, let's, let's not imagine what they might be. But all I can say, can I just, you know, if you're going to caveat it by a whole load of assumptions and ifs, buts and maybes, can I just urge caution on coming up with a, a number? Because once it's out there, it's out there. Yes, I, I understand that. And, you know, this at the moment is we have an idea of the number that you uh, would need per annum not to go into the green belt, but it's a much lower number than the 488 figure that has currently been given to us um, by the Office of National Statistics. And it depends on a number of things, for example, how many units you could build in World Wars and, and other things. Um, so we would be some distance away from a position where we would be able to avoid going into the green belt. That's the way I would answer um, that question. All right. I, um, I, think, I, I think that's fair. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Now, in, in terms of the local plan, um, this is prescribed in terms of the um, Acts of Parliament that we have to comply with and also things like the National Planning Policy Framework. So it's very <coughs> prescribed as a process. And within that, um, before you can submit your plan, it's got to go through a number of tests of what are called soundness. So it's got to comply with a whole range of things. Now, as things stand at this moment in time, whether the number from the ONS of 488 stands or whether that number is increased or, or whatever it is, as I mentioned, we're some way away from um, a number that would mean we would not have to go into the green belt. Um, so my professional advice is that uh, to comply with the soundness tests and the housing numbers and the needs that we've got at the moment, the plan that the council submits will have to have um, an element of green belt uh, development within it. Now the way it works is the plan, as I've mentioned, is over 15 years. So the land supply is split up into five year chunks. Now what we will seek to do is maximise everything in the urban area, brownfield sites, willow waters and all those other things that I've mentioned. And if we can maximise that, then that reduces the take on the green belt. Now we don't release all of the green belt in one go, we would only release the green belt over periods of time as and when you actually needed it. Now over a 15 year period as well, the other thing that will happen is of course population will change, um, household formation will change and other factors will change. So your housing number that you agree in the local plan uh, will change over time and that's why we have to review the plan every five years. So clearly if we need less housing over that 15 year period then there's less release needed of, of the green belt and the other things and that's the way um, it works uh, from there. But in my view at the moment, as things stand, the plan would have to have that element within it okay. to be sound. All right, and, and thank you for your very full answer. Now, as I said, Jackie is here now. Um, I hope you haven't rushed to get here. Sorry, uh, Jackie, because uh, we're still going on. What, what I'm going to do is to um, try and limit colleagues now. So the people that have indicated, and I'm going to call Mike, um, Mike Sullivan first, then I'm going to call um, David Burgess-Joyce, and then, um, then I'm going to call uh, Tony, and then close it down. People content with that? We've had a really good run on this. So, no, we're moving on. Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to add to the debate. We, we've listened very carefully to what people have said. We were given arbitrary figures um, where we had to come up with a local plan, and we've done that, and we are still in the consultation period, so there's a long way to go. 
But I personally, I don't want to see any of the green belt built on. I'll say that categorically. And if needs be, and I said it at the, the council meeting a couple of weeks ago, I would actually go to court and challenge the government's figures if we need to. Um, but there's a long, it's a long process, and it is, and, and the comments the lady made near the front there about people's lives. But this council can't force any, any landowner to sell their land to build on. So the farmer's, the, the, the farmer's future is in the farmer's hands. We've just, as a council, we've identified land, that's all. And it's out there for consultation. And we are listening, we certainly are listening, but there's a long process to go. And if necessary, I'll state again, I would challenge the government in the High Court. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, as always, Mike, and thank you for being brief. Um, so, uh, David, you indicated. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I have no intention of, of, well, I was going to be brief, but I won't be. Um, some of you may remember that Wendy and I held a, a meeting in Greensby a short while ago, and it would be wrong of me to say that I am professional on this subject, because I'm going to be very unprofessional. So I'm going to apologise in advance for two reasons. One, I'm going to be unprofessional about what I'm about to say. And the other one is that I'm an estate agent. And I, I always like to get that out there very, very early on. The reason why I mention it is because we've got a fight on our hands. And at the moment, none of you will remember 1939, but 1939 was the phony war, where war was declared but nothing actually happened. And that's what's happening at this moment in time. And as a result, as an estate agent, I took the decision that my company would not support any developers coming into the world to, de to develop any of our greenbelt. But what's happened since that Greasby meeting is I have been contacted by 24 developers and nine Consultants. Now the consultants, and Mr. Simpson may well know what I'm referring to here, but Simpson uh, knows full well, better than anybody, how people will come into this great place of ours to try and advise. And what they do is they come in from London mainly, and they advise developers on how to undermine and usurp the process of planning so that you can merge villages and towns together, that they will advise with great support from legal minds on how you can get planning on our beautiful green belt. So if you think that this is now going to be a nice, polite fight and everyone's going to discuss things politely as we are currently, then you're in for a shock, ladies and gentlemen, because if anyone's got a tank or an armoured vehicle, I suggest you bring it out now because the barricades are going to have to go up. I exaggerate no way. The reason why the council wants building on Greenbelt is because that brings in higher rates of council tax because those are the houses that are the G's and the H's. That's the plain reason for this. New house bonus. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. So please be under no illusions. We are in for a significant fight, and I personally do not want any building on any of our beautiful sites. Because the moment you start to do that and you allow a developer to do that, you've set a precedent. And guess what? It will chip away, chip away. There is no requirement, and I don't know about you, but the last time I looked, the Wirral wasn't a hugely industrial area. And there weren't great tracks or swathes of workers coming onto the Wirral needing housing. Professor Gregg did some great work on how little the population is on the will increasing. That's not going to change any time soon. And if you genuinely believe that people who buy houses on the Wirral aren't already residents of the Wirral, I can tell you as an estate agent, the vast majority of people who buy houses off me already live on the Wirral. They're just moving to a better postcode. That is the way it works. So I, I told you I'd be unprofessional, but I am not going to allow our beautiful, beautiful Wibble to be trashed by anybody and certainly not by developers. Thank you very much.
Mr. Chairman, I think you're dominating this meeting. There's many, there's one of the very important facts come out, then you can I'll leave. There are, by the Council's own admission, 7,635 dwellings capable of being built on brownfield sites. Oh, you know that? You know that already? I, I know that there are a lot of brownfield sites. Can you change to be yourself? Built. Chair of the meeting. Uh, okay, fair enough. So uh, expressing free speech. <coughs> right. Um, I, I think I'll try to be as open and inclusive as I possibly can be. And to prove that very point, my Lord colleague had indicated later on he'd like to say a word. So, so Tony and then David and then we move on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, um, I swear that the people here tonight must have been set out the blueprint for the uh, speech that I delivered at the town hall just a few weeks ago. Because uh, listening to all of the points that I put to the Labour leader of the council, you've actually brought up. I think the first point is we've now seen uh, that the figures were grossly overestimated for the 12,000 housing need, um, and we're now down to a more potentially realistic figure of 488. So that gives somewhere in the region 7,300 houses over a 15-year period, which is a long time. A lot of things will change over that time. But let's look at the reality there. So Whittle Waters have actually suggested, Peel have actually said that they can deliver over that period 6,000 dwellings. Now the dwellings that we are short of across the UK are one and two bedroom properties. They are not five and six bedroom houses. So here the lady shouts out about uh, what about the golf course and that ties in clearly with my own ward um, in that the plan to level the green belt in my ward is for 160 what will effectively be ban G and H houses. Now far be it for me to suggest that that will be a council tax income uh, generator uh, of any sort between two and a half and three grand council tax a year and maybe that will be the actual uh, driving force behind that particular development. Now, the other one is the NC houses. Now, there's been figures bandied about between four, six, and I'd have even heard up to 6,000. So let's say uh, David suggested a, a figure of 4,600. I've heard 6,000 was suggested from offices just a few months ago. So we, we, we're getting on to somewhere between, I don't know what, 10,600 of new developments on Brown Belt um, and empty properties that can be redeveloped when we're only looking at 7,320 over a 15 year period. So I explicitly disagree with the, uh, the officer David Ball, who's only doing his job, as Jeff has said, um, that we need to go into the green belt because we clearly do not, the figures do not stack up. Uh, the other point I'd like to make, David suggested uh, something, it's not just about population, and it isn't um, housing formulation one and two bedroom properties that we need and the likes of Whittle Waters do come into it um, but also the economic growth. The reality is if the um, commercial aspect of Whittle Waters does not come to fruition uh, there will not be any economic growth within Whittle. But I don't know where this magical economic growth that Phil Davis, the Labour leader, believes is going to come from. It isn't. Now, my last time on the council was between 11 and 14, and uh, Will Waters for Phil at the time was going to be the Shangri-La, and for some reason he's now turned his back on it. Um, as you will, uh, many of you will have seen in the papers, Peel were not happy with the suggestion that uh, it was Peel dragging their heels, and they're not. They're ready to go with the first development right now, and I say get on with it, give them the opportunity, get on with it. But I just want to read you something. This will dispel uh, many of the Labour myths that have been getting spun about how we come to the figures. But what happens is the government has given every council a calculation on how to come up with a housing need. Uh, it is not a government figure, it is a local figure. And this is why. This is from the Secretary of State. Uh, so he, he said, how to meet housing demand, whether it is possible to meet demand, where to develop, where not to develop, what to develop, how to work with neighbouring authorities, and so on, remains a decision for local authorities and local communities. So it is our council and us that have to come up with a, a, a proposal for you. Now the way it works, the uh, Labour Council will now have to go away, explicitly state in the local plan what it's going to be, um, a development plan, a development land for um, uh, businesses, uh, so commercial land, what is going to be development land for housing and what will be protected as green belts. And as I said to um, the leader of the council, 
and uh, during the last uh, council meeting, that I believe they dragged their heels for 13, 14 years on that because they're scared of you, you actually seeing what the plans are for our green belts. So the point is this, once they've gone away, put the actual local plan, it's put before you, you get the opportunity to say whether you are happy with it at the ballot box. That is your opportunity. That is why, that is why. Secretary of State meant when he said local authorities and local communities, that is your opportunity to have your say whether you're happy with the plans that have been put before you. Thanks. It's been going uh, an hour and 20 minutes on this one, so I'm going to ask David to finish off, but then, Jackie, it, the floor will be yours. Okay? All right, David. Yeah, uh, thanks, Chair. As many of you will know, I've been on the planning committee probably longer than anybody else for the last 18 years and chairman of it on many occasions. Um, my concern is the banding around of us wildly very set of statistics and numbers associated with what we actually need, what we don't need, what we might need, conditional upon so many unknown and un un uh, unable to be de decided matters that it's difficult to say really what we want at all. Uh, my point was twofold at this stage. One, the empty houses thing, which I was going to allude to before somebody else did. Um, we really don't know whether it's 4,600 or 6,000. Whichever figure it is, great effort and priority must be given to getting those back into use because that would make a heck of a difference to what we actually require. The second thing is, which concerns me as a member of the planning committee, as I say, spokesman and chairman on many occasions, is we have well over 1,500 approved planning permissions for housing. I've mentioned this before and I mentioned it again. I would like David, possibly if he can, to give us an updated figure on that because if only pressure was put on these people who have wasted our time going through the process of identifying sites that are suitable for development and granting them approval, if only they got off the backside and actually built them, their excuses are that they're trying to increase their property portfolio's value. Sometimes that's a reason for it. Because obviously, if you, you own a house and you want somebody to build in your back garden, your house is obviously going to be worth an awful lot more to sell it if it's got planning approval in its back garden. Some people do that as a cynical way before they sell the house. So not only are they changing the quality of the area, they're giving somebody else the opportunity to build something which might be overdevelopment on the site, purely because they've got planning permission for it. The second lot are people who go for planning permission but haven't got the wherewithal, means, funds or contractors available to carry out the work for them. So there needs to be far greater pressure put by officers on um, those who've got planning permission to actually get off the backside and get on with it. We have a problem, and I'll conclude on this point, we have a problem that within the present planning system which we're trying to get changed, if you get planning permission for a house, you've got three years from the date of planning permission to start it. That means you dig a hole in the ground, you lay a couple of drains and you walk off. You've then got the next hundred years to finish it. There is no pressure put on you to complete it once you've started it or to start it for three years. And that is an appalling situation. The, the final point of that is that when planning permission runs out, which it does after three years, these people who've got this planning permission in their pockets then apply again. And because nothing has changed, they usually get it granted. So in other words, they've got a continuous planning approval for as long as they like for a piece of land that might well be a derelict site, it might well be brownfield, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter. The point is they are stopping us being able to build the houses that we need in our area. And finally, just sorry, a couple of final this is for the final, final one. Um, there's no doubt about it that the growth statistics are wildly varied and wildly out of control. Nobody really has any idea how this uh, borough of ours is going to develop. We're not attracting an awful lot of people. As uh, my colleague down there rightly said, most of the people who buy houses in the world are people either downsizing or upgrading and just moving around in the world because they choose to do so. We're not creating a vast empire of industrial or commercial requirements that need housing. If and when real waters happens, okay, that will increase the need for housing. But that, the housing will come on the back of development that's already been done. So the thing is a self-contained operation. I worked for 20 years in at uh, Wirral Waters, sorry, at Wirral Waters, at um, Salford Keys, alongside, as a contractor, um, with Peel. 
If anybody can do it, Peel can do it. Peel need to be given unguarded, unwarranted, unqualified um, assistance in developing what they're trying to do for us. If they were to get that, we'd find a lot of our problems were overturned immediately. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David, uh, voice of reason, as always, a great war colleague. Uh, <laughs> just, just the figure, and then I really do want to move along now because Jackie's been wasting a while. Outstanding planning permission. Yes, I, I'd have to come back to you on the exact figure, but it's above the one and a half thousand. I think it's over two thousand, uh, really, that we've got those. But, Chair, could, could I just explain just a couple of things just to put that into context in terms of what we've done for all of the extent planning permissions is we've written to all of those people with those planning permissions, we're meeting with them, and we're talking to them about how they can get those developments away. Some need help and support, which we're providing to do that. Others we're about to commence uh, shortly on those things. So we're not inactive on the planning permissions that have um, been given by the council. Indeed, we're trying to be as supportive as we can, because like you and like Council Elderton, we want to see all of those permissions built. You know, that's where we're coming from. Okay, that's, okay thank you. That's great. And can I thank everyone for their contribution? Uh, I think it's a, a, like a part of me, obviously, but members kept their uh, comments nice and brief and succinct and clear. And the, I think the contribution from the people, I think about 12 or so, uh, contributions were, were very uh, pointed and hopefully have elicited. The one thing I would just um, uh, go back to is the point I made a little bit earlier, um, more graphically described by David, but I think it's important that everyone stays organised around this because, the, as David said, there's a lot of discussion to go on, lots of decisions to make, and clearly people need to stay organised and maintain that pressure and that the intellectual robustness of the case that says, actually, there's all these other options out here before anyone even thinks about uh, building on the green belt. So, thank you very much for that contribution. Hopefully, you found it a useful discussion. What I'd like to do now is invite Jackie to come up and talk to us about um, the Urgent Care Centre development or Urgent Care Transformation as it's described. People want to... Do you want to see Okay. Um, okay, I'm sure I speak on behalf of Jackie and say if you ever want to, she might be quite an interesting um, presentation. Um, okay. Okay, Jackie, are you okay to go? Absolutely, thank you very much. Um, so, good evening, everyone. Um, firstly, just a quick uh, couple of introductions. I'm Jackie Evans. I'm an assistant director working across the clinical commissioning group and the council with the lead for unplanned care. Um, my colleague on um, my left is Zoe Delaney, who's one of the team working with me on this development. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank um, everyone for the invite tonight um, to talk about this uh, transformation and consultation that we've just commenced. Um, we have left on the back table copies of the consultation document and that includes details of how to let us have your views, a variety of options there, so please feel free to take a copy um, and it also gives details of where, where it is on the website to find, to find the documents as well. Um, conscious you, you, you know, you've had a busy evening so far, so what I'm going to do is we've just got a few slides, I'll take maybe up to 10 minutes just to quickly give an overview of the proposal.